All right, so now we're recording. Uh, and everybody here is on mute. There were quite a few people who submitted questions in the RSVP form, which is great. We try to get to as many of those as we can, but you also can submit them in the chat uh, below if anything comes to mind during the presentation. So in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Devin, who is the founder of GVpedia. But just a quick uh, couple of notes about us in case you haven't been here before. Uh, GVpedia is, uh, was born out of the opportunity to provide um, comprehensive resources to everybody regarding facts about gun violence. So we have our gun study database, which is the largest in existence, which currently has over 2000 academic studies. And we also provide access to what we call GVP University which uh, is a collection of fact sheets and white papers about gun violence. And both of these are, sub are searchable by subject matter and they are free. And so we hope that advocates and educators, elected officials, anybody who uh, needs to learn more about gun violence can use these resources. Uh, it's also, uh, we're also home to the Facts About Firearm Policy Initiative. And recently we released the fire hose of falsehood, which is something that uh, Devin will get into a little bit today when it comes to defensive gun use. So I'm gonna turn it over to Devin so he can uh, share with everyone more about the topic. He'll do that for a couple of minutes and then we'll get into the questions that everybody submitted. Or like I said before, if you have something to add into the chat, we would be happy to have you do that as well. All right, Thank Devin. you so much. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And so the plan today is to cover things for about 15, 20 minutes, um, just going over the top line levels of the defensive gun use myth and why it's so important and what to do about it. And then opening up the floor for any and all questions, because the defensive gun use topic overall is a very broad and large topic of substantial importance. And there's a lot of different nuances and various things that we can potentially get into. And I wanna make sure that this is as useful as possible to everybody here. So today we're gonna to cover first, what is a defensive gun use? Because there are a variety of definitions out there. Then we're gonna go into the various claims about defensive gun use. Um, so, for example, how widespread defensive gun use is, whether it's effective or societally beneficial. I'm going to go into the history of the defensive gun use debate, all from all the way from the 1980s to the present. Um, talk about why defensive gun use is such an important topic, and then what we can do about it in combating this myth. So, first, what is a defensive gun use? So the broadly agreed upon definition among academics is that it occurs when a citizen either fires, brandishes, or reveals a firearm in an attempt to stop an assailant from committing or completing a crime. So there's some form of attack and the other person is using a gun or the victim is using a gun in self-defense. Um, typically police related shootings are not counted in defensive gun uses. So it's merely citizens. And this can be in defense of oneself, others, or even property under American law. And while this is somewhat vague, we're basically stuck with it because there's a variety of things. Like if shots are fired, that's going to clearly be labeled under the potential defensive gun use. If shots aren't fired and the firearms merely brandished, typically that's considered a defensive gun use. And if no sh shots are fired and maybe a gun's merely mentioned, that can get into gray territory on whether that's a defensive gun use or not. And as we're going to explore, the line between offensive gun use and defensive gun use can be very hazy. And so hazy, in fact, that a majority of purported defensive gun uses and surveys are very likely offensive uses, but we'll get into that more later. So there's three main questions when it comes to the defensive gun use debate. Is defensive gun use common? Is it beneficial for society? And is it more effective than alternative means of self-defense? And the simple answer to that is no, which is where I could wrap up the presentation, thank all of you for coming and log off, but given that it's a GVpedia presentation, 
we're going to go into substantially more detail. So to answer the first point, defensive gun use is not widespread. Many of he you here have probably seen um, pro-gun sources claiming that there's upwards of 2.5 million defensive gun uses each and every year, which corresponds to something like several thousand every single day, and that defensive gun use is used far more than offensive uses, and guns are fantastic and great, so the argument goes. However, um, unlike in the 1980s and 90s where we didn't have hard empirical data on defensive gun use because it wasn't being collected, we do now from the Gun Violence Archive, which has been reporting these figures since 2014. And they find between 1,000 and slightly over 2,000 verified defensive gun uses annually. Now, the Gun Violence Archive collects these from police and media sources so there is the potential that if someone does not report a defensive gun use to police or the media, that might not be captured. However, all the surveys done on this indicate that more than half of defense, defensive gun uses are reported to the police. So that means Gun Violence Archive should be picking up around half if those estimates are to be believed, in which case you'd have something like 4,000 defensive gun uses annually in total, which is a far cry, as you've probably noticed, from 2.5 million defensive gun uses. And so there's no hard empirical support for the 2.5 million number as we go into in detail in our defensive gun use um, report, um, which I'm happy to go into even greater detail on on this specific point. Um, the numbers in that are mathematically impossible. You'd have to have, for example, with burglaries, um, people sleepwalking with their guns and having a defensive gun use in order to make the numbers even possible. And there's no scientific evidence for that, fortunately. So defensive gun use is not widespread. Um, there's also substantial evidence that is not beneficial for society. Every type of data source whether it's surveys or empirical data, find vastly more offensive than defensive gun uses. Um, oftentimes you'll hear from pro-gun advocates stating that there's three to four times more defensive gun uses than offensive uses, which is just a made up statistic. They take numbers from one set of survey data and then compare it to another set of survey data with entirely different methodologies ignore that if you look at offensive and defensive gun use from the same type of survey, all of them find more offensive than defensive uses. Also, when you just look at defensive gun use itself, so ignoring stated offensive gun uses, and look at the details of those incidents, um, studies have shown that more than half of those reported defensive gun uses in surveys are actually illegal activity and constitute offensive gun uses. Finally, one of the main things that pro-gun advocates talk about with defensive gun use is that, well, it might you might not need the gun for self-defense, but if you do need it, um, if a situation arises where you are being attacked, having a gun is the best way to protect yourself of all the options. And that simply is not true. So even the research pro-gun advocate site to try and make this point finds no statistically significant difference in injury rates between using a gun or an alternative means of self-defense. In fact, a recent, well, not so recent anymore, but back in 2016, there is a survey by David Hemingway of Harvard that looked at injury rates on defensive gun use and found that doing nothing and using a gun in self-defense had basically the exact same entry rates. And other surveys have found that using something like a baseball bat or other mechanism of self-defense had lower injury rates or calling the police or running away. So when it comes to preventing injury, there's no substantial difference between using a firearm for self-defense or another means of self-defense. So kind of in summary here on these points, Defensive gun use is not widespread, 
There's no real evidence that it's beneficial for society, and it's not the most effective means of self-defense. So given that fact pattern, why is it the case that so many people think that having a gun for self-defense is the best option? And this has been the subject of a three decades long academic war on defensive gun use and its effectiveness. Back in the 1980s and 90s, we started seeing these privately done small surveys that would find or purport to find millions of defensive gun uses in the US. And one of the most famous ones was Gary Klex. I believe it was in 19, conducted in 1992, where he surveyed 5,000 individuals. 66 of them said they had a defensive gun use. And whenever you extrapolate that to the US population at the time, that equals 2.5 million. David Hemingway, who's the research director at Harvard um, for the Injury Prevention Center, um, looked at these numbers and found that they were mathematically impossible based on the crime figures that we have readily available from other sources. They just did not add up. And at that time, during the 80s and 90s, we only really had surveys to rely on because the gun violence archive didn't exist yet for the empirical data. And there was kind of a stalemate where both sides dug into their respective positions and both said, well, we need further empirical evidence to determine this. Now, Dr. David Hemingway clearly had the better argument given that, again, the numbers Gary Kleck were providing were mathematically impossible, but it just, the debate kind of settled there for a couple decades. Until in 2013, after the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, then President Obama signed an executive order saying, hey, the government should produce a report indicating where more research on guns should occur. Basically asking for a literature review, what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to study. And in 2013, um, the CDC went to the National Academies of Science and said, hey, we'd like this report to be done. The National Academy of Sciences um, put together a committee of experts, and they released a 100-page report. Um, overall, this report took a couple months to put together rather than a couple years, which is standard for such large reports. And the resulting document, 100 pages, was relatively uncontroversial, except for the section on defensive gun use, which went ahead and made the argument that defensive gun use is widespread and there's more defensive gun uses than offensive gun uses. And that one page of the report that mentioned that was instantly seized by pro-gun advocates as like, see, even Obama's CDC confirms that there's millions of defensive gun uses. And when looking at it, it's kind of bizarre that this fragment, which is objectively false, made it into the report. And so part of our defensive gun use investigation was asking the people who were involved with that report, what happened? Well, as it turns out, Gary Kleck himself was a member of the committee that put this together. Um, multiple academics who were asked to review this raised severe concerns about the defensive gun use section. Like, what are you doing here? This is false. This needs to have additional context and more information. And those concerns were basically ignored because this report required consensus among all the committee members. So one committee member could basically filibuster the entire project if they didn't get their way. And the academics told me that that's almost certainly what happened and why there's the, these objective falsehoods about defensive gun use got into this government report. And it's this government report is more important than just, oh, pro-gun advocates are able to cite it. It was cited in the... 2022 Supreme Court decision on Bruin. It's been cited in other government figures. It was on the CDC website for a while. Like this had 
far-reaching impacts on basically resurrecting these false claims about defensive gun use. And so from 2013 to 2014, um, that's when gun violence archive data came about. So the 2013 literature review didn't have access to hard empirical data on defensive gun use. That came out a year later. And what that empirical data showed was that there are not all that many defensive gun uses annually. There's just no evidence for it. Despite this new empirical evidence, there have been further attempts to resurrect this defensive gun use myth. Um, in 2017, when Donald Trump was elected, um, John Lott, a major pro-gun advocate who has a long and storied history of academic misconduct, reached out to his contacts in the Trump White House, one of whom is now, uh, I believe, Ron DeSantis's chief of staff, to say like, hey, there's all these studies done on, under the Obama administration, and we want to have um, accurate work done by the Trump administration to reject all of this. And in 2020, John Lott finally got his chance when he was um, put into the Trump Department of Justice. Now, his tenure there was short-lived. But during that time, he was consistently trying to find evidence to discredit the FBI reports on active shooters, which was also casting severe doubt on the widespread defensive gun use myth. Another part of this trying to resurrect the defensive gun use myth came in 2021, where a newcomer in this academic debate by the name of William English from Georgetown um, published a new survey indicating that there were millions of defensive gun uses. And this work was done with the express purpose of helping the pro-gun side in um, the Bruin case. And it was cited by Justice Alito. And now this new work, which I still think has not undergone peer review, um, claimed millions of defensive gun uses, but committed all the same errors that Gary Kleck's surveys had done. In fact, it made it even worse by asking people over their lifetime whether they had had a defensive gun use. And the more years you add on to it, the more likely somebody's memory is going to be fuzzy on a topic. And so it not only made the false positive problem worse, and that's something I can get into with further questions, um, that Gary Kleck's survey had had, but it doubled down on it and made it even worse. And yet, despite how poor this evidence was, it was being cited in, by the Supreme Court. And then finally was um, our effort at GVpedia to push back on this. In 2021, um, we reached out to the CDC um, to correct the numbers on their fast facts page because they were citing the inaccurate information from the 2013 National Academy of Sciences report. Um, there is a back and forth of emails, and then we eventually got a meeting with the CDC. Paul Murray joined me, Mark Bryant of the Gun Violence Archive joined as well, and we talked to them about the current evidence on defensive gun use and urged them to add more context to the page, or if that wasn't feasible, to just remove the estimates until better data came out. And so this occurred in 2022. So it took around six months for them to remove it from the website. And then nothing really happened until six months later. So the end of 2022, when a pro-gun lawyer had put a FOIA, FOIA request for the emails between us and the CDC and got all those. Of course, there was nothing suspicious about the emails. We were just laying out the evidence, but he went ahead and sent it to a pro-gun outlet. And then for the next month, you had Breitbart, Fox News, The Epic Times, Newsmax. Basically, if there's a right-wing source that you can name, they were covering this. And it got went to the degree where you had members of Congress calling for an investigation of the CDC in terms of removing these emails or for removing the um, numbers. And it just goes to show how crucial the defensive gun use narrative 
is to these groups that changing one line on the CDC fast facts page led to people calling for massive investigations and overhaul of the CDC. And so it's still an ongoing battle in a way, even though the debate should have been settled back in the 1990s and definitely by 2014 when the Gun Violence Archives Defensive Gun Use data came out. And yet we're still here. So why does this matter? Well, one, truth matters. <laughs> and so that should be sufficient. But also because it's at the heart of the gun lobby's fire hose of falsehood that guns make people safer. And this is a deliberate tactic by the gun lobby and, and in particular the NRA. The Trace uncovered some internal documents from the NRA's meeting in 2021 and it found this from the, their information division director. And I'm quoting here. We know from repeated research that the vast majority of Americans agree that law-abiding people have the right to defend themselves and their families with the firearm of their choosing. This is why no matter the policy, our messaging continues to focus on self-defense. Nowhere is this clearer than our work to expand right to carry laws. There is some evidence that the NRA's work to expand right to carry laws in the 90s and early 2000s helped drive public support for self-defense with the firearm. That support has now made it possible to further expand right to carry. So basically, regardless of what policy the NRA is pushing for, whatever they're doing, it's all going to tie back to the central defensive gun use myth. Because through decades of careful marketing and messaging, they've made it to where the defensive gun use myth and the idea that guns make you safer is widespread and common. And we have to be able to push back on this in order to make a substantial difference in gun policy. Because even if we were to pass every single gun, gun law that saves lives tomorrow, it would have a substantial impact but still would not change the overarching narrative from the pro-gun side that guns make you safer. And that attitude is critical to change in order to generate more support for laws that save lives and to get gun owners to reflect on like, hey, what we, we have a dangerous weapon in the home and we should take care with it. So how do we counter the defensive gun use myth? This um, comes back to our earlier research that we released last year on the gun lobby's fire hose of falsehood and how best to counter it. Just as a refresher, um, the fire hose of falsehood is a coordinated campaign by the gun lobby and particularly the NRA that treats the information space kind of as a battlefield. And they seek to overwhelm people with high volume and multi-channel um, information that they produce that's rapid, continuous, and repetitive. So they seize on one false claim and then keep pushing it over and over again from a variety of sources. It lacks commitment to objective reality. So even if that information is debunked, it does not matter to them. They're going to continue to push it. And it lacks commitment to consistency. So they could argue one thing that favors their narrative and then the next day argue something else that would appear to be contradictory, but still supports that narrative. And unfortunately, research shows that a fire hose of falsehood is a challenging thing to overcome, particularly if there's not a coordinated response. And so one of the critical things is there needs to be a coordinated response to this disinformation. One of the aspects that you can do at the strategic or organizational level is create a fire hose of truth, making sure that we're pushing out accurate information consistently to counter the inaccurate information, deploying inoculation campaigns, so making sure that people are aware of the disinformation and why it is incorrect before they encounter the NRA's messaging to begin with, enacting things like deep canvassing tactics where we're having in-depth conversations with people who might be on the fence or who haven't heard much about gun violence in general and making sure accurate information is readily accessible to them. Focusing on at-risk populations for the defensive gun use myth and other pro-gun narratives. Recently, they've been focused on getting more women to buy guns, as well as the Asian American community, 
for just two examples where they're really targeting their fire hose of falsehood and unfortunately seem to be making ground. And finally, and somewhat counterintuitively, we need to avoid censorship because if we just try to block out these myths, we're not going to be able to um, block it out everywhere. There's a massive number of pro-gun and generally right-wing outlets out there who will promulgate this in information. And censorship tends to lead people to the question of like, well, what are they hiding? What don't they want me to know? And can even strengthen people's belief in this narrative. In this case, sunlight is definitely the best disinfectant and making sure that people are exposed as much as possible to the accurate information. At the personal level, so things that we can all do, is making sure we have conversations. Now, conversations does not mean logging on to Twitter or X or whatever it's called now um, and engaging in a thousand tweet long um, argument with somebody that you've never met and has five followers. Like these conversations need to be with people who are close acquaintances or even friends who might disagree. And starting with in a space of what do we have in common? What do we agree on? And building a level of trust. And once that trust has been built, then investigating the other party's beliefs and core values, figuring out why do they come to this position? Like what's their personal story and why do they personally believe that a gun is going to make them safer? And once you've explored that together, then you can start building a fact-based foundation to be like, oh, well, this part isn't accurate. Let's instead, look, let's look at this information and talk about it and see how it might change things. And so an ongoing conversation that's based on trust and exploring the truth together. And then once you reach that stage, finally being able to motivate the person to action by one powerful narrative that can then get them from just ta from instead tacitly agreeing to you to actually doing something and taking action on this issue. And the good thing about this framework for countering the fire hose of falsehood, it doesn't just apply to defensive gun use, but the idea that like more guns mean less crime or shooters target gun-free zones or any number of myths out there, all of them can be handled in this way. But it takes a lot of work and even time to build up these sort of relationships to help counter this myth at the personal level. So with that, you can learn more at gvpedia.org. We recently put our 12-part series that appeared on Substack into one great big PDF document that you can find under GVP University. And also, please subscribe if you haven't already at armedwithreason.substack.com, where we're releasing not just long 12-part series written by me on defensive gun use, but commentary from across the gun violence prevention space. Um, just today, in fact, we released an excerpt from Thomas Gabor's and Fred Gutenberg's excellent book, American Carnage. And just yesterday, we, we released a um, article by a high school student in Texas who's holding rallies and making a difference there. And so it's really a space for the gun violence community overall to talk with itself and to help spread accurate information. So please subscribe there and follow us on all social media. And with that, hopefully I kept on time and am able to answer any and all questions. Yes, thank you, Devin. We definitely have some time for you to answer some questions. Uh, quickly, one thing I wanted to ask you to bring up is there is a story that you share in our recent uh, PDF publication about defensive gun use that's really impactful. And so I'm wondering if you might give us um, a recap of that story. Yeah, so th this was one of the more interesting aspects of doing this deep dive into defensive gun use. So I was interviewing Mark Bryant at the Gun Violence Archive for the story, and he brought up a, like a story from several years ago that he had encountered um, where he was perusing one of the many pro-gun um, blogs slash channels 
out there. And he ran across this story where a guy was like, you won't believe what happened to me last night. And according to him, what had happened was he was coming out of the movie theaters the previous evening and with his wife, and he noticed three black men approaching him. And according to him, they looked up to no good. And so fearing a situation, he brandished his firearm at them and they quickly scattered. And this guy was proud of his defensive gun use, have a, having averted anything else from occurring there and was proud of himself. And so posted this on the pro-gun forum. Later that day, Mark Bryant was talking with the assistant district attorney for the same small Midwestern town. And during the conversation came up, you won't believe what happened to me last night. So I was there with my brother and one of his friends um, who were at medical school in Vanderbilt, but came here to watch this movie. And as we're approaching this movie, we see this old white guy all of a sudden pull his gun on us. And we just had to take off because we didn't know what the heck was going on. And as it would turn out, this was the exact same event. So why does this matter? Well, for the surveys that, that find millions of defensive gun uses out there, they're taking the word of the person who had the defensive gun use. If this guy had been surveyed by Gary Kleck, it would have been, yep, I had defensive gun use. It obviously saved lives, and I'm quite heroic. When instead, what he did in reality was commit aggravated assault on people who just wanted to go watch a movie. And that's why David Hemingway's own research that actually looks at the responses that people provide to these surveys is important because he went ahead and provided the judges, a panel of five judges with these responses. And they found taking these people's um, claims at their word, at face value, that more than half of these are almost certainly illegal. And that's giving them the benefit of the doubt. And so almost all of these, or a large majority of the report defensive gun uses in surveys are actually offensive uses, just like the story relayed from Mark Bryant. You're on mute, Caitlin. Thank you. Uh, when we spoke about that story initially, I remember, I mean, it sounds obvious, right? Like in, in every interaction, there's multiple sides to how that story is, right? That's just basic human communication. But when you think about how one person reports what that was, right? A, a defense brandishing the weapon in an effort to uh, keep a crime from happening. That person in turn created a crime and, you know, pulled a gun on somebody or, you know, that's how it was taken the other way. So um, I think it's really important to keep that in mind, not only for us, but when we're trying to advocate for common sense gun legislation. So speaking of legislation, uh, there's a variety of folks on here and to RSVP and who are looking forward to watching our recording later who have asked in a myriad of different ways, you know, how do we have these conversations, right? How do we start this conversation about defensive gun use when we're meeting with uh, a staffer or an elected official? Um, what's the best way to do this? I know you, you brought up some of the points here in your presentation. Thank you for going back to that slide. But um, how do you how do you break the ice for this, right? We, we know that people tend to get defensive, uh, especially if they feel like, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to tell them that they, they, they can't have their guns. Or they shouldn't have their guns. or want to take their guns at whatever they're, they're, they're going to perceive what, what we are trying to share with them. But what would you offer is the, the best way to start this conversation so that somebody is not only listening, but actually hears what you're trying to say. Yeah. So legislative means is probably one of the toughest places to have this because like, particularly if it's with um, a pro-gun legislator who's backed by the NRA and it comes from a very conservative district, like they might be more nuanced and agreeable behind closed doors where it's like, yeah, we recognize that the data is like this, but my constituents believe this and I have to represent my constituents. Like that happens a massive number of times. <laughs> 
But if somebody truly is very set on the defensive gun use myth um, in a sort of legislative context, it's going to be difficult to convince them otherwise. However, like given that it's going to be important and you're kind of stuck there, it's basically sticking with the facts and trying to figure out, all right, so why do you think that there's defensive gun use that's widespread? What evidence would change your mind? And I, in almost every context, really like the question of basically asking somebody, what would change your mind? Because if the answer comes, or what evidence would change your mind and what constitutes evidence for you? Because if the answer is nothing, then mm -hmm. there's no point in having the conversation. Like they're dead set on their ways. They're not going, they have no interest in changing and nothing you're going to do in that moment is going to persuade them anyway. So at that point, it's basically cut your losses um, and move to somebody who's potentially more amenable to the evidence. Um, now, once you have somebody who's outlined, oh, there's these surveys that indicate 2.5 million defensive gun uses, there's this and that, and there's more offensive than defensive gun uses, and even Obama's CDC agrees with us. Like that provides an opportunity then to be like, all right, let's analyze each of those in turn and being able to provide detailed refutations of each. Now, the odds that you're going to change your mind from zero to 100 is still quite unlikely. But by providing the accurate data and data that's specific to each of their points, um, that's going to provide room for potential doubt and areas to grow and figure out um, how to move forward with this. And it's going to be likely a long process. Most people don't, when hit over the head with a lot of evidence, don't go, oh yeah, you're right, my bad, I'm going to change my entire core policies here. But it can start moving the conversation forward that way and still needs to be based in those facts. It's also important, I think the story that you shared especially is the perfect example. We can't be naive to the fact that things like racism matter a lot in this space. And if that exchange had been with somebody who was white, who was walking by, would that whole experience have occurred or not? And obviously that is a doctoral dissertation for another day and maybe for somebody else, unfortunately not for myself. Um, but those things matter too, right? Those are about ethics and, and values and, and the lenses that we see the world through. Certainly not excusing that behavior, right? But just something that we have to keep in mind. Um, I am going to, I don't, I don't want to like time you officially, but if you had to take 30 seconds to explain to somebody why the research is flawed, that's currently out there. How can you do that? Right. Cause it's easy for us to get into the weeds here. It's sort of what we <laughs> awkwardly enjoy to do, but 98% of people aren't necessarily going to be into that. So what's a really abbreviated way to explain why the research on defensive gun use that out there that a lot of people take as gospel is flawed. So I'd use my first wish of 30 seconds to ask for an infinite number of 30 seconds to explain. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no can do. But, um, <laughs> basically pointing out that the, I think the quickest way is to point out that the numbers are impossible. So it would require people sleepwalking and having defensive gun uses while, while they're sleepwalking. Um, that's what the numbers themselves indicate. Um, there's the numbers indicate 200,000 or more people are shot every year when there's only hospital records for uh, around 100,000. Um, so the numbers are wrong there. And basically at every single stage, the numbers are just implausible. You can even break it down to a day basis. It's like you actually believe that there's three, like 6,000 defensive gun uses every single day in the U.S. And that nobody, including the pro-gun lobby, like the NRA, Heritage Foundation, and so forth, 
is picking those up. Like there's just no real evidence there. And so I would stick with those points showing that these claims are just outlandish and actually pointing to hard empirical evidence. And if somebody's like, no, it's this many, it's, then it's like, prove it. Show your work. Show that there are 6,000 defensive gun uses yesterday. Like, because that's what they're claiming. And the burden of proof is on them in that case. So just point out that, like, look, if you think that's the case, then demonstrate with actual hard data. So maybe that was a minute and 30 seconds, FYI, but maybe yeah. taking the larger number, the millions and breaking it down and divided by 365 days a year by argument's sake and saying yeah. it sounds very unlike the media to not snag any of these instances. Right. Uh, yeah, so not just the media, which somebody might distrust, but it's like, okay. yeah, if that number of defensive gun uses is, is being hit, hidden, the NRA is in on it. Gun Owners for America is in on it. So like the conspiracy has to go super deep, <laughs> basically. Right. Right. And I think pointing it out like, hey, that would mean this. And yet none of these pro-gun organizations have evidence for it might cause somebody to pause and be like, huh, yeah, that does sound kind of weird. Okay, interesting. Katie, I saw you had your hand raised before. I didn't know if you meant to, to do that. I did have a question. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you considered, um, you know, like in the fact sheet, you specifically used the um, gun violence archive estimate. Um, did you ever consider doing some kind of, um, especially since the the interpretation of this is so varied, did you ever um, think about doing some kind of range based on like GVA and the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is probably still, you know, it suffers from some of the same survey issues that the other surveys suffer from. But given that GVA is probably an undercount um, because many crimes go unreported, um, I'm just wondering about that decision and like what as a as a movement we, sh you know, want to be communicating. Yeah, so the way I kind of handle that, I think there's a way to simplify it as well. But to go into the min and 30 second version rather than the 30 second version. Um, basically, I think it's, I forget which section it is, but we do provide, a well, it's in the section where we talk about the gun violence archive data. We do provide a range. So it's like, all right, if gun violence archive is missing half because surveys indicate half of defensive gun uses are reported to the po police, that would mean 4,000 defensive gun uses. If, well, the surveys that Gary Kleck puts out and the National Crime Victimization indicate around 25% involve shots being fired, which if shots are being fired, we can be pretty confident that it's going to be reported in some fashion. If those are all that's being reported, well, that means there's around 8,000 actual defensive gun uses. Or you can take an outlier claim that's like 95% of all defensive gun uses are merely brandishing, which again is an extreme outlier. Even if you do that, that means there's, you're getting into national crime victimization survey data range there of around 40, 50,000 ish, basically 40,000. So under realistic assumptions, you're going to have around 4,000 to 10,000, maybe 20,000 there. Now, keep in mind as well that if somebody's not reporting a defensive gun use, there's likely two explanations for that. One, they use the gun in self-defense. The person actually was a major threat to themselves and their livelihoods. And after this harrowing experience where they saved their own life, the person's like, nah, it's somebody else's problem now. The police don't need to know. That's profoundly irresponsible. Like, if you feel it necessary to use a gun in your own self-defense against somebody who's a threat to your livelihood, that person 
is then a danger to society and police need to be aware of that. The other option is use the gun against somebody and realize um, there probably wasn't a threat there. I might have done something illegal, <laughs> so I'm not going to tell the police on myself. In which case, the defensive gun use was, again, likely illegal. So the more cases that aren't reported, that's more cases that are either going to be illegal or irresponsible. And so if cases are reported, that makes it more likely, not a certainty, but more likely that they're going to be responsible cases of an actual legitimate defensive gun use, which do happen, but it's just extremely uncommon relative to the others. And so if somebody's out there saying like, oh yeah, 99% of cases aren't going to be reported to the police, well then you're basically arguing that 99% of people who engage in defensive gun use either did so illegally, so it's an offensive action, or they're irresponsible. I think when framed like that, it can really shift the perspective on to where it's like, oh, there's actually a substantial problem here if all these cases aren't being reported. And to just provide actual evidence to where it's like, all right, you think that, how many cases do you think are actually going to be reported to the police? And then it's like, all right, we have that figure. And then just multiply it by whatever the amount is and you're going to get something less than the National Crime Victimization Survey, unless it's a truly outlandish claim. I hope that answers the question in a few one minute and 30 second <laughs> increments. Devin, is there, considering the the big part of the picture that defensive gun use plays in all of this, is there value in saying to John Hopkins or one of the university research centers that works in this, like, hey, we think that this in, uh, data that's been collected before is a bit bogus and um, let's let's redo this, right? Like, let's come about a different way of collecting this information and trying to get a number that's uh, more appropriate to be, to be used. Right. So, I mean... Yes, to a degree, but there's only, there's two ways to collect the data here. There's either surveys or there's the hard empirical data. The Gun Violence Archive is picking up the hard empirical data. And now, unless Johns Hopkins has reason to believe that there's a lot of official police reports and others that Gun Violence Archive is not picking up, in which case, then absolutely people need to know, especially me, <laughs> so I can revise this. Um, like, so the empirical collection day has basically already been taken care of, unless there's major errors there. And there's nothing I've heard to suggest that there's major errors there on the gun violence archive side. The other is surveys. But we know, given that defensive gun use is a statistically rare phenomenon, that there's going to be more false positives than false negatives. So if regardless of who you are, if I tomorrow were to put out a survey of 5,000 individuals and just ask people, did you have a defensive gun use? I would likely get around the 66 or so responses and the 2.5 million figure extrapolated from that. It's not because Gary Kleck was trying to manipulate that specific data in the survey itself, it's because surveys of rare events produce overestimates. And it's just mathematically the case that you're far more likely to have a false positive there where somebody lies and says they had the case than a false negative. And so it's a problem inherent with the surveys themselves. And now would it be great for Johns Hopkins to put out a research report laying out all the problems with it and kind of doing what we did here, except having the full weight and backing of the Johns Hopkins brand. Yes, I do feel that the defensive gun use aspect of the gun violence discussion has not been studied sufficiently or at least critiqued sufficiently. I mean, when you look at the research, there's... 20, 30, maybe 40 academic articles and studies on this. Uh, 
which when compared to other topics that get hundreds of studies, it's a very small area, which is disappointing because it's such a massive part of the pro-gun narrative. Like every single claim, statistical claim that they make comes back to defensive gun use in the end. Why, why don't gun laws work? Well, it's because it prevents people from protecting themselves. Why does more guns mean less crime? Because it's more people protecting themselves. Why do shooters target gun-free zones? Well, it's because people have guns to protect themselves. Like every sort of claim ties back to the defensive gun use myth at the end. And if you're able to debunk that myth, none of the other claims have any weight. And I do think there is a fear in academia that is in part justified that they don't want to be seen as advocates because if they're seen as advocates, then their credibility is kind of low. And it's like, oh, you're just an advocate. I can discount you, ignore you. They want to be above the fray. But at the same time, if you're above the fray, that's letting disinformation like this be widespread and continue on its way without sufficient refutation. So the act of like not getting into these sort of debates or discussions, like it keeps the fire hose of falsehood from, it allows it to keep spreading, but at the same time, if they were to directly counter it, it would reduce their credibility. So it's sort of a no-win scenario. I personally think that Johns Hopkins, Harvard's done a lot of work on this, um, University of California and others should do more refutations of defensive gun use and deep dives into the data and analysis. But I definitely recognize that it's a very fraught and complicated issue for them. And I, I don't have a perfect solution to that, but I do think more sunlight needs to be put on this myth in particular. And that needs to come from academia as well. Um, to ask or, or to ask one of the questions that appeared in. Sorry, uh, I to, oh, go ahead. Technical difficulties. No, I was just going to ask um, if there's a way to change the narrative about defensive gun use into the fact that more people are likely to have a gun that's in the home used against themselves than an intruder. Yeah, so there has been quite a bit of research on this. Um, one of the ones in chat was talking about Arthur Kellerman has a study finding that it's 22 times more likely to be used against you or a loved one than in self-defense. Um, Dr. Kellerman's work was not the only study on this. There have probably been five or six case studies that looked at this, and every single time they find that there's more offensive uses than defensive uses. That being said, those studies look at whenever there is a death in the home. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily be capturing other incidents, whether somebody's abusive with a firearm or having a defensive gun use that did not result in somebody dying. And this goes to a different question that we got um, in the RSVP form. But I would highly advise people not to use the FBI data on justifiable homicides as evidence for overall defensive gun uses, because it's only counting a specific form of defensive gun use where it results in somebody's death. And two, the FBI data um, has been getting worse and worse in terms of collection because it's voluntary for local police departments to report to the FBI. And that voluntarily rate has plummeted in recent years. So it's not even a particularly solid data point for justifiable homicides itself. Well, I do think it's capturing most of the um, justifiable homicides. Gun violence archive data is actually just going to be better on that and finds more cases of defensive gun use resulting in a fatality than the FBI does. So I would rely on gun violence archive data for that in particular. But now returning back to the studies themselves, um, one of my favorite studies to cite came from 
I want to say 2012 or 2014, that found that a firearm in the home doubles your risk of homicide, triples your risk of suicide from Dr. Engelmeyer and several colleagues. And that study was actually a um, review of all the other studies that had done this. They reviewed more than 16 studies and they came to that average. And that also, that risk of death includes defensive gun use. So if it was actually the case that people were using guns defensively in a widespread fashion, those homes should be safer than homes without a gun. And yet we see the opposite, that having a gun in the home doubles your risk of homicide, triples your risk of suicide. So those broad statistics are quite as important as well when it comes to the defensive gun use myth. It just requires a little bit of connecting the here's the homicide and suicide data and here's how it relates to defensive gun use, but it's still quite important. Got it. Okay. So maybe not surprisingly, we have lots of questions that we didn't get to either <laughs> submitted via RSVP or here in the chat. I did save the chat though. So we'll go through these and uh, some of the questions that we received are very similar, or at least they overlap. So uh, what I can do with Devin is um, combine some of those together and, and we can take some time, answer some of those questions for you, and then send out an email with this recording, uh, just giving some more insight into something that we may not have answered. We also have, we know that there's a lot of intricacies in defensive gun use. And if for whatever reason you want to learn about something more specific, Maybe it's about um, legislation that's going on, or that might be going on um, in your state or something that is pertinent to your organization specifically, then just reach out to us. We're happy to, to plan a Zoom call with, with you, with your people, uh, with anyone, just to go over those things more in detail. Um, and when I say we, I mean, I will organize logistics and Devin will answer most of your questions. So, uh, and then one last thing someone had asked about uh graphics for social media. And yes, that's something that we try to do is create some uh, graphics that have a handful of words and make sure that we're not overwhelming people so that they're easy to share. Uh, so that's something that we will be working on. And then I think that's pretty much it. The last ask that we have for you, Devin brought this up earlier, but if you are subscribed to our Substack, if you get the emails every day, that's fantastic. And we appreciate you participating. If you can think of four or five friends to invite to it, um, there's the free subscription. And then for a couple of dollars a month, people can can pay to be part of that as well. And that gives you access to all of the pieces we publish, not just the more recent ones. So we're just trying to grow that, uh, that space. It's something that we saw was a need for the gun violence prevention community. And we are also always looking for folks to write um, things that are long, things that are short, poetry, sharing about experiences at, 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 at anything related to gun violence prevention or gun violence in general, um, we would, we would be really happy if anyone here would like to contribute. So, uh, feel free to just, just let us know. So other than that, I'm going to sign us off here. And like I said, we'll send a follow-up email that will have some answers for, uh, everybody. And, um, just remember that on our, our website, which was the link I sent in the RSVP email, You'll find all our defensive gun use information, including our fact sheet and the new PDF that we just published. Anything else, Devin? I think that's it. Um, in terms of graphics on our fact sheet that I've pulled up quickly <laughs> here, we do have a couple graphics, one on the two times risk of homicide, three times risk of suicide, but also the defensive gun use myth um, explained showing defensive gun use relative to offensive uses. And so if you go to our defensive gun use page, you'll be able to find that there. If you go to GVPD Explains, we also have videos on these topics that break down some of the aspects of this. And in the months to come, we are planning on breaking down even more specific topics. So if you have something like, hey, this would make a good graphic, um, let us know. <laughs> and the odds are <laughs> your thought might be turned into an actual graphic. Um, so we're always consistently looking at ways to simplify this data and highlight the most important aspects for people. So thank, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and deeply appreciate your support.
Absolutely. And when it comes to graphics, we know the kids these days are really savvy at these things. So I know the youth are super powerful in this movement. If you have anyone who's looking to make a difference and wants to devote a little bit of time, we could always use some help with graphics too. So send them my way and um, would love to collaborate with them. So, all right, well, we'll see everybody out there. Thank you so much for all of your work and for coming today. Thank you.